Welcome to the People of Animal Health podcast. The host of our podcast is Stacy Purcell. Stacy is the leading executive recruiter for the animal health industry and the veterinary profession. She's the founder of Therio Partners and the Vet Recruiter. Stacy has placed more professionals in key positions within the animal health industry and the veterinary profession than any executive search professional. Along the way, Stacy has built relationships with some outstanding people who are doing incredible things to make a difference. The People of Animal Health podcast features industry leaders and trailblazers who have made a significant impact or are making an impact in the animal industry or the veterinary profession. Stacy chats with them to learn more about their lives, their careers, and the unique and interesting things that they have done to contribute to the animal health industry or veterinary profession. She's here to share their stories with you. Now here's the host of our podcast, Stacy Purcell. Hello, everyone. Welcome on to the People of Animal Health podcast. On today's show, we are talking with Albert D. Rienzo, an entrepreneur who is an animal health and human health and wellness innovator. In a career spanning nearly 30 years in academia, government, and industry, Albert held positions with the Forensic and National Security Sciences Institute at Syracuse University, One Health Group, Red Sky, Blue Highway, National Biodefense Science Board, Welch Allen, Phillips Medical Systems, Siemens Medical Systems, Honeywell, Sperry Aerospace, and General Dynamics. In recent years, he was recognized twice as the medical device industry's most valuable thought leader by Frost and Sullivan, and as Technologist of the Year by the Technology Alliance of Central New York. He also received the Future of Health Technology Award for pioneering work-promoting entrepreneurship in the medical and scientific fields, as well as the Frost and Sullivan Catalyst Award, which is the first ever given for being a game changer and visionary in multiple disciplines and industries. Welcome on to the People of Animal Health podcast. And how are you, Albert? Oh, I'm very good, Stacy, and it's a privilege and a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I am so glad that you've joined us today, Albert. Thank you for being on our show. Albert, I know that you have experienced tremendous success at this point in your career, but I'd love to start off at the bottom and the very beginning of your career. What was your life like growing up, and where did you grow up? Oh, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. So uh, I grew up mostly in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, my father was a career Navy, so uh, moved around. I've uh, been in a number of different states, but majority of my childhood in Virginia Beach. Um, you know, I was uh, even a geek as a kid. I, I took everything apart in my, my family's house that you could imagine because I was curious at a very young age, how did things work? And I eventually learned to actually put things back together and fix them and, uh, you know, always had that inquisitive sort of uh, uh, spirit. I think, you know, I got a lot of that from my parents. Uh, my mom was a biochemist. My uh, dad, again, career Navy and uh, was uh, sort of a math whiz. And uh, I, you know, had a really uh, great upbringing, you know, very supportive upbringing, uh, had a lot of opportunities to explore. Um, I did start school a little bit uh, uh, later than most as far as uh, college. Uh, I was um, uh, one of those people who was sort of pigheaded. I had to do everything on my own. I didn't want my parents putting me through school. I wanted to do it on my own. So I actually became a welder <laughs> in a shipyard for uh, several years and paid my way through college, my undergraduate program, uh, which was focused on computer science. And, um, and it was a very good experience. I, I had mostly an application-oriented versus theoretical-oriented uh, education and got to, to participate, participate in a number of different activities, um, which, again, great professors um, and a very supportive environment. And from there, I moved into um, a variety of different opportunities. You, you sort of read a laundry list off there of the things that I had the, the experience and privilege to do. And I actually started initially in things to do with the Def Department of Defense and things for that sort of environment. Uh, later, I was approached by Siemens Medical Systems and asked if I could apply what I had learned in things like radar and sonar and uh, systems engineering discipline to medical. 
And uh, it was an ultrasound. And that's what I did. I was one of the first systems engineers they brought on board. And I had a lot of uh, experience and success working with some very new ultrasound systems and capabilities, implemented some of the first neural networks and uh, fuzzy set theory types of applications. Um, I learned a lot uh, uh, there and continue to move my career forward with Siemens and uh, CAT scanners and oncology systems. I was in the first team at Siemens that uh, set up the new design controls, working hand in hand with the FDA and design controls. And then I um, uh, continued my medical career, mostly in imaging. And uh, eventually it culminated where I was very uh, fortunate to be one of 13 um, appointed under the Bush administration and continued under the Obama administration uh, to be on the National Biodefense Science Board. It was the first ever, and we were there to protect the American public and support our allies in areas of chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats, whether man-made or um, naturally occurring. And, you know, that has a, a public health uh, component as well. Uh, what we recently, uh, you know, experienced with COVID um, and previously swine flu, things of that nature, um, we would participate in. And, um, and, and from there, I was also um, uh, set up as a professor of uh, forensic science at Syracuse University. And that uh, you had mentioned in that Forensic and National Security Sciences Institute. But I just had the privilege of working with just brilliant and highly collaborative um, uh, people in that in the biodefense. Uh, from there, I've continued uh, not only in the human health, um, uh, but also in animal health, and, and they're intrinsically linked. Um, if you think of One Health, uh, which is the company that I lead today, One Health is that intersection of human and animal health and, and accounting for environmental uh, variables and impact on that. Uh, and I think it's so important for the future health of our planet, as well as um, human, humankind and, and animals. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've had that touch point on animals and humans throughout most of my uh, career. So again, very sort of colorful career, very fortunate. Uh, I'd love to tell you I orchestrated it, you know, to flow in a particular direction, but I was just... Uh, uh, very privileged in, in what I was able to do. Wow, wow. What a fascinating story. Um, you started out as a welder in a shipyard and um, was appointed, you know, worked with Bush and on Obama on biodefense and um, so many interesting things that, that you've done. Um, was there a point in time, because you've, you know, you've been in all these different areas, was there a point in time when you said, you know, you figured out what you wanted to do professionally and how, how did you, um, you know, how, how did you finally decide uh, what you did want to do professionally? Yeah, um, I, I would say most of my adult um, life, even from the time at welding, uh, I've loved innovation and I've loved being able to try to push things that uh, were maybe they, they haven't been successful before or into totally new areas. So even welding, I was one of a few that was teamed with the metallurgical engineers and the welding engineers uh, to come up with new processes to introduce those into the, uh, the shipyard. And so I've always had that innovation bug and, and loving to push uh, what, what uh, exists, you know, where can we improve? And, um, and I would say, so I've always had that, that uh, perspective. I would say figuring out what I really wanted to do is I moved into um, more executive level positions where I could have even a greater impact and really help orchestrate uh, across different departments with, uh, you know, new collaborations, new academic institutions and so forth. I just, I just love uh, what collaboration and sort of like-minded perseverance and interest can accomplish. So for instance, um, I was the principal investigator on a U.S. Army program called the Personal Status Monitor, and that was to remotely monitor the health of um, military personnel in the field. 
And that project had over 12 different uh, external entities, academic, industry, and government, all working uh, to realize that outcome. So I just, uh, you, you know, I, I just thoroughly enjoyed that when people would bring different expertise, come from very different backgrounds, and realize something that had not been realized uh, before. Again, to the to the benefit. Uh, of many. And I've just continued down that path, even what I'm doing today with One Health Group, though we're uh, very much so animal health focused, uh, we're trying to do it in a way that is very cost effective and in a way that brings information that was not easily uh, accessible or attainable um, before by the professional or others, uh, you know, that might be in a from a scientific background and the like, and I'm happy to share more if, uh, if we have time. Yeah, I, I do want to hear more about that. Um, how did you first become an entrepreneur? Um, I, I think, again, that has always uh, been ingrained in me. Uh, you know, my, my mother, for instance, um, you know, when she was, uh, 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 working on her chemist, biochemistry degree. She, she went for her master's in biochemistry. Uh, and this was back about 1950. And then she was starting to work on her PhD. That was almost unheard of, right? I mean, she was uh, really a pioneer in that. She ended up running central laboratory for major hospital system and just uh, sort of being sought after in that uh, biochemistry space. Um, and then I, I saw a similar sort of work ethic and entrepreneurial spirit with uh, my father. And so I think I just was very fortunate uh, in my upbringing, even all, all four of my grandparents uh, immigrated uh, from Italy to the United States. And one of my father, uh, grandfathers, you know, started a business and he had like a general store. And oh, by the way, he took care of a farm and he also was a coal miner. So you're, you know, you just look at the work ethic uh, that I was fortunate enough to witness and experience and also that, uh, that diversity. So um, I think that's always um, been in me. And as I've moved more and more in my career, I find that's what I uh, gravitated towards. I was never very good at uh, just sort of road activity. Um, I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to um, experiment and see what might be possible. And I find that as a uh, leader, I try to do the same thing, give people time to play and, and experiment and see what might be, uh, might be possible. Well, you had good role models growing up. Oh, thank you. How did you go from the uh, human medical industry into the animal health industry? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, from human health, um, you actually get exposure uh, to animal health. And I don't mean this to be offensive, um, but, you know, the reality is, is you're working on a new drug or there might be a new process or new medical device, um, almost always there's animal touch points. And, and it usually progresses from animal uh, to uh, human and then gets released to market. So you learn very early in your career uh, to appreciate uh, that, to care for those animals, to make sure that um, uh, you know, your experimentation is, is well designed and that the outcomes, again, are beneficial all the way around. And I find, this is why I love One Health, I find that there is so much in common. So, for instance, about 70% of our infectious diseases, humans, you know, get, they, they start in animals, make a, a leap to humans. If you think of, um, you know, those would be zoonotic diseases. If you think of vector uh, born, based or vector borne diseases, you know, things like mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, so forth. Those have gone up like tenfold over the last couple uh, decades. And, and, and of course, some of our methods of testing and so forth have, have improved um, that, that allows us to, to understand what's going on. And then if you think of our chronic diseases, you know, animals get about 70% of our chronic disease. They deal with heart failure and lung issues, osteoarthritis, and, and so forth. So, I, I love marrying those two uh, together, those sort of those two worlds in that environment. 
and then working on the predictive analytics. How can we preempt uh, a particular disease or a situation before it ever occurs? And if we can't uh, mitigate it, uh, you know, in a simple lifestyle change, maybe it's nutrition, maybe it's exercise or something of that um, approach, um, you know, take the minimally invasive approach possible. Maybe it's a pharmaceutical, um, you know, you try to uh, hold off on the more invasive things like surgery um, uh, to the end. Um, but uh, I, I find that if we can, again, predict, there are a number of things that can be prevented and so that's uh, my, my passion, better quality uh, of life, better clinical outcomes, uh, you know, less money uh, spent uh, uh, trying to maintain that uh, quality of life, something that improves clinician workflow, uh, creates some stickiness and highly, high collaboration and touch points with their, their patients and others in the patient's um, network. All those things are sort of important. I'm also passionate because my father uh, passed away of Parkinson's and he didn't have, it, it wasn't genetic. You know, a lot, a lot of it was due to the things that he was exposed to in the military and things that we didn't know at that time had a negative impact. You know, whether it's you're close to uh, uh, a top, tox, toxic substances or whether it's you're uh, impacted by uh, extreme blast going off in your vicinity, uh, things of that nature, um, you know, really is what resulted in his Parkinson's. And so he, all my grandparents really lived into their 90s. Uh, he passed away in um, at 84. He should have lived much longer. But again, it's a passion. I just don't want to see people uh, go through those types of experiences. Uh, animals, of course, die much earlier than we would like them to, right? I'm part of the, um, working with um, some researchers and been discussing um, how our solution can fit into the National Institute of Health's canine longevity uh, study. And, uh, you know, which is on, I believe, 30,000 canines. Uh, and it's really, how can we extend the life of our companion animals? Uh, why is it that they uh, they might pass when they do? And so, and, the, and animals have become like family members. And so, you know, my, my passion is to as much as possible minimize that suffering um, and just to imp improve that overall uh, quality of life. So I, I, I know it's sort of extreme and you, and, you know, we always have suffering and we always have diseases and so forth with us. Uh, but, you know, I want to do what I can to uh, positively impact that. Yes, improve the quality of life. You know, we can learn a lot from animals. Um, Albert, when do, when do you feel like you were first gaining traction with your career? Um, I would say probably that interaction with Siemens when I moved over into 100% medical and moved into Siemens ultrasound because it was um, a position of significance and one that helped set the future direction of uh, ultrasound practices. I also got to spend time in clinic um, and really work with the doctors, the nurses, uh, the patients and their families uh, to uh, you know, really understand what problems need to be solved and how can we deliver those in a manner that was very friendly to use for the clinician and very friendly also for uh, the patient and provide those types of um, insights that were necessary. So I would say, you know, that was probably mid-career um, and I just really enjoyed that. I also appreciate this as a you know, commercial for Siemens, but Siemens was uh, technically very astute, they, you know, you, they, they were very um, into the science and technology and, and really trying to bring about systems that were actually researcher friendly, providing researchers all sorts of functionality. Um, you know, in later years I worked for Philips and again, Philips was a fine company. So not, not to take anything away from either, but I would say that was the big uh, career shift. And from there, I think my career just really took off. Mm-hmm. I know that some successful people have massive success, but also some low points. 
Walk us through the highest high and the lowest low of your career. Oh, wow. Um, so the highest high was probably my time on uh, National Biodefense uh, Science Board. And that's because um, the people that I worked with on the board were incredible. They were highly accomplished, and but there was no uh, infighting. Uh, there was just this great uh, spirit of collaboration and uh, just tremendous productivity. We were all, even though we were special government employees, everybody had a full-time job, but we put in hundreds of hours uh, to ensure that we could uh, um, meet the objectives that we had uh, set out for us as well as that the government had set out for us. And so that, that was the best group of people I have ever worked with just because of their passion and, and uh, collaboration. So that, that would be the highest high. Plus there was so much value that wasn't obvious to the American public that we brought because a lot of what we did is underneath uh, the radar screen, you might say, you know, it could be, uh, you know, confidential or, or secret information or so forth. And a lot, if you remember that time in history, it wasn't all that long after 9-11. And so we were there, uh, you know, really to prevent something like that from occurring again. Um, and also it was neat because I worked on diagnostics. I got to work on medical countermeasures. I got to work on uh, very early things that had to do with PTSD, just a number of things. So it was, it was just wonderful. Um, low point. Um, I would say a low point in my career was I was in Silicon Valley. Um, the, I was working for a startup that was in, in the medical space, but more consumer facing. And, um, and there, you know, there, the, the dot-com bubble had burst. And not that we were a dot-com company, but it impacted uh, available funding. And also there was a huge downturn in uh, military developments and consolidation of military bases. And so there was almost this influx of people coming into Silicon Valley um, that were coming from other areas and, and it couldn't support uh, you know, the jobs for them. And so the startup that I was part of, we, didn't, we were unsuccessful at raising uh, another round that we needed to keep the company going. And the company just, you know, collapsed. We continued to work for months uh, with no pay and just still trying to make things happen, but we just could not realize it. And I had just uh, had my second, not me personally, I, my wife had our second child and, uh, and uh, you know, she, she was maybe, our, our, our daughter was maybe three months old. We just moved into a new house not too long ago. So I was like, oh my God, all these pressures and all these things just seem to be, uh, you know, crushing in. And it was, uh, it took a while to find another position that I thought was interesting and uh, where I could have impact just because the economy was uh, not, not thriving. So I'd say that was a low point. It was, it was really challenging. At that low point, Albert, what did you learn the most from that experience? Um, well, I think in uh, most things, just continue to persevere. Um, but, you know, believe in your, your gifts, your experiences, um, and just continue to persevere, uh, hold true to your values. Um, you know, and, and certainly I'll give tremendous um, credit to, to my wife because, you, you know, during those times, um, she was, as she is today, just incredibly supportive. And uh, so I had that, uh, that, you know, that support system. And so um, I, I think those are the things that were important, the relationships and, of course, just uh, trying to be true to yourself and what's important. Perseverance and, and having that support network to help you through those uh, those challenges. Absolutely. I'm curious. I'm curious, Albert. What has been the most surprising thing to you during your career, as well as two part question? What is the most surprising thing to you during your career in the animal health industry? Um, so the most surprising thing to me in my career is. Um, I'll say being able to 
uh, have an impact on the medical community. And what I mean by that, I've been very fortunate to be part of uh, teams and in many cases lead teams that have released over a hundred different medical solutions um, in a wide variety of areas. So I was never pigeonholed in, oh, you just do CAT scanners and that's all you do for your whole career. I mean, I got so many touch points in uh, different uh, disciplines and in different uh, go-to-market types of solutions. So I would say that is certainly something that was um, key, you know, very surprising to me. And I apologize, Stacey, what was the second part of the question? The second part was what's been the most surprising thing to you about your time in the animal health industry? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yes. So in the animal health industry, um, I, what I think is surprising uh, or what surprised me is, uh, in, in, from my perspective, a lag in some of the new innovations um, coming to market. There's a lot of things you see happening in human health. Well, it's, hey, why isn't that happening in animal health? I think that is starting to really turn around, uh, but I was uh, disappointed. You know, I always thought human medicine, very conservative, which I understand, uh, very slow to adopt new innovations. Again, I can, I can certainly understand that, but I saw in the uh, animal health world, it was even uh, more conservative. And uh, I what think, do you think the reason is for that? I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm curious as you keep going what the reason yeah. is for that. Yeah, I think uh, part of it is, uh, you know, the training uh, is they certainly have very intensive training that has to cover a, a, a breadth and depth of animals and, and different approaches. Um, you, you know, they're, they're, if you look in the United States, the, uh, the insurance system for animals lags far behind when you think about insurance and the human uh, side, uh, though it's certainly gaining uh, traction. I think that also there is um, a very uh, conservative approach and a lack of um, instrumentation or even new uh, pharmaceuticals and so forth uh, for the professionals to work with. And also, if you think of the number of companies in the human health world, it dwarfs the number of companies in the animal health world. And then finally, I'll pick on funding. Um, you know, funding is much more uh, prevalent or readily available for, not to make it sound easy, but for those in the uh, human health world with new innovations than in the animal health world. Now I see that changing and I get a little bit frustrated because it's like, wait a minute, you'll invest in human, but not animal or vice versa. They're, again, they're intrinsically linked, you know, for solving this problem for one, it's helping to solve it for another, most likely not in every case. So I think those are some of the primary things to answer the last question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and how have you seen the animal health industry change during the time that you've been involved in the animal health industry? Yeah, so I think uh, one of the things I'll re-mention re is certainly uh, there has been more funding uh, that's coming into that community. Um, there are some major strategics, you know, that have innovation funds now and are uh, much more collaborative. They're uh, separated out in a lot of cases, especially in the pharmaceutical world from their, uh, you know, they've, they've separated out from what used to be a parent that played in both the animal and human world where they uh, normally took a backseat to the human applications. And so now they can uh, focus on those animal applications. I think that you're seeing a lot of things in telehealth, telemedicine come online um, for uh, animals, and you see a lot of upstart companies that have everything, you know, from new new pharmaceuticals to new topicals and, and biologics, as well as uh, different types of uh, medical uh, devices. And so I, I see a lot of momentum uh, that's that's taking the, the whole animal health world uh, for plus, uh, when you think about it, and again, not to not to uh, sound cold, but to, you know, take 20, 30 years ago, animals weren't necessarily considered part of the family, and certainly when you look into the the West, animals are more and more part of the family. Uh, they're seen as family members. Uh, spending has certainly uh, you know continued to rise uh, for animal health as well as just uh, animal uh, you know nutrition and toys and and things of that nature. Uh, and you're seeing that reflected in many other geographies uh, around the world. 
So I think that has also uh, helped during COVID, just look at how, in just the states alone, how, how many animals uh, have been added uh, to, to families, uh, you know, in the companion animal uh, space. So I think uh, that's certainly a, a very positive impact. What does your crystal ball say about the future of the animal health industry? Um, so I think it is uh, bright, uh, and, and for a lot of the reasons that I talked about, there's a lot of momentum, and I just see that continuing to uh, snowball, which is great. Uh, I do think there'll be greater regulation. Uh, so if you think of design controls in the human side from an FDA perspective, you don't really see that so much on the animal side unless you're putting radiation into the animal's uh, body like you might with a, a radiotherapy system. So I think you'll see more of a design controls from a regulatory perspective as more medical devices come on uh, line. Um, I believe that there is uh, much more of a focus on One Health uh, so I'm very fortunate I get to serve on the uh, Cornell uh, uh, College. Uh, it, it's a, in engineering, but biomedical engineering. And we're talking about, uh, hey, how we're integrating with the Cornell University Medical School as well as the veterinary school. And I think there's just a lot more momentum and understanding of how important it is to, to integrate those. And so I think uh, the future, you're going to see more in the way of medical devices, more um, focused pharmaceuticals, uh, more foods that are definitely uh, science-y types of foods that address certain issues, whether obesity, osteoarthritis, and, and so forth, and then uh, better guidelines uh, for animal nutrition. You know, animal nutrition is an area that still lacks today when you think of the number of nutritionists that exist in that um, uh, sector, but I see that growing. Um, and so I think the future is uh, very bright, and I think you're going to start to see even more uh, momentum. I think even a lot more medical uh, devices. You know, that's, that's what I'm pursuing, a, a new medical device with uh, my teammates and I, and, and uh, I think it's almost game-changing, and, uh, and I'm excited about it. Share more about that, Albert, if you will. I know that our listeners would love to know about the kinds of projects that you're up to right now. Uh, yeah, th thank you for that, Stacey. So um, what we're uh, working on and what we're hoping to release by uh, before the end of 2022 is a new uh, contactless um, uh, device. Uh, it, it, it's a sensor that collects anatomical, functional, and uh, physiologic information, but in a non-contact manner. So it could be in a collar, it could be in a harness, it could be in a bed or a feeder, uh, any number of locations. Um, and, and the beauty is it collects clinical grade information. Um, we, we use a part of the 5G spectrum to collect that information in a very safe, uh, again, non-invasive manner. Uh, and we, we collect contextual information. So what I mean by that is when we collect a, read, a reading uh, that might be, you know, heart rate or blood pressure, we know what the animal is doing at that time. Were they running? Were they sitting, laying down? Which side were they laying on? Were they eating? You know, so there's, we try to put context to those readings, which is very uh, important for the clinician as, as well as the pet parent. And then we report that out to a mobile app, giving general health uh, status as well as alerts, and then also go to a cloud-based dashboard that has some predictive analytics uh, that can detect things early, you know, whether it's a trend change or whether we notice something um, that's not quite right in a reflected signal that we're looking at. Uh, we can bring that to the attention of the clinician as well as the pet parent or farmer or, you know, clinical research organization, whatever it may be. So it's small, it's light, take any form factor, uh, can work on any animal. And, uh, you know, we even have rodent pads where you can monitor rodents, uh, you know, canines, felines, equines, uh, it, it doesn't make any difference. So we're pretty excited about the flexibility and the, the potential. We just literally last, um, Monday before last, we just got our 76th patent issued on this uh, technology. We have about another 30 pending and we've had about 12 clinical studies. So it's, it's developed in unison 
with veterinarians, right? It's not a bunch of geeks out there, scientists, technologists saying, oh, wouldn't this be neat and, and developing it. We're doing it in unison with the professionals. Congratulations on getting your 76 uh, patent. That is that's so exciting. Thank and you. I'm curious, it sounds like you wear a lot of hats. Uh, what does a typical day look like for you these days? Uh, uh, that's an interesting question. So um, we just recently, or we're, we're all, almost there, uh, completing a fundraise. So you, you can imagine about 80% of my time was uh, spent on, uh, you know, presenting the company and and going through due diligence activities and working with the investors and, and the like. Uh, a, a number is just running uh, the business and taking care of operations. Some of it is certainly putting my science or technology hat on and working with others in the team as well as outside the team. And just having a lot of conversations with some preeminent uh, veterinarians, academic institutions and, and the like. But I will say for the last five months, I have really been heads down working with an due, external due diligence team that we're just closing uh, a funding round on right uh, now. And that's when it's gonna get really interesting to get you know our alpha units out there, beta units, uh, and then production units into the hands of the professionals. Yeah, wow, best wishes with all of that. E exciting times for you and your business. Well, you. Albert, I'm curious, what are some of the daily habits that you believe have allowed you to achieve this level of success that you've had throughout your career? Um, I, I would go back to certainly uh, perseverance. I'm, you know, people probably tell you I'm pigheaded or stubborn. I uh, s sort of get myself focused on something and I just pursue it. It, it doesn't mean blindly, but uh, I've, there's been a number of times in my career where I've been told it's impossible. And, um, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to prove that wrong, you know. So I'm sort of stubborn, uh, I would say. I, I, I try to persevere. I mean, it's been a long road to get this company to where it's at uh, today. And, uh, you know, we started it uh, back in uh, mid-2017, and we self-funded and uh, until this point. So, again, perseverance. I think it's important to just uh, operate with integrity. So I always tell people, hey, what you see is what you get. I, I don't put on pretense. I think you need to operate with uh, transparency. You need to be open. You need to be collaborative, uh, not, not be so protectionist. Uh, you know, matter of fact, in our solution, we have open APIs because we want people to integrate with us and us to integrate with them, uh, which we think is important to move uh, the, the, the uh, medical, uh, animal medical and healthcare uh, you know, market forward. Um, I, I think operating, uh, you know, ethically, uh, I, I think having sort of that global mindset uh, is important. And um, I just, uh, I, I, I try to be approachable. So I think, you know, for younger people on the team or those I interact with, I try to be a mentor and try to sh share with them some of the experiences. Uh, but I will tell you from those fresh out of school to those I've worked with for 20 years, I'm always in learning mode, right? You'd be a fool to think that you have the market knowledge on something or you're the preeminent person in a particular thing. So I always remain uh, open and in, in learning mode. And, and then I try to keep the passion. I just, I still love innovation. I love having an impact. I'm very passionate about what I'm doing. I will tell you, I'm, I'm probably a, a workaholic. I mean, both my kids are gone. And, um, and I have a very understanding wife and I sort of live this stuff. So I, uh, you know, I'm sort of on seven days a week and, and uh, always trying to be pretty responsive to, to those that uh, are reaching out and vice versa. Well, I think some of the most uh, successful CEOs have that always be learning mindset, that intellectual curiosity. Oh. Yeah, I, I can I can see that. And, and you know, I, I sort of love it, too. One of the things I really try to do is it's not about Al DiRienzo. It's about the team. It's about the success of what we're trying to do. It's about all those that we're trying to have a positive impact on, um, you know, with our offerings and with our solutions. So I always um, I always used to, to say it seriously on biodefense. I'd say everybody on the team is so much smarter than I am. 
And I think it's important to have that humility, uh, honest humility or humbleness, not a false. And I think have that um, even sort of putting others first, because it's, it's not about you. You've got to try to advance things by helping others. And again, having that uh, sort of team, team camaraderie and, and uh, being highly collaborative. Yes. And you, you talked a moment ago about uh, mentoring others. I'm curious what mentor has made the biggest impact on you in your career? Um, boy, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll cite my father as certainly a big impact because that I would even reach out to him uh, when it came to career decisions or just things that I was doing and ask for his guidance. Um, he was, you know, a really smart guy, had a lot of experience, uh, different experiences, very trustworthy. I just appreciate who he was, what he had endured. And so I'd say my father um, overall, but I will tell you, I, I've had mentors at different stages of my career and some have taught me, you know, finance, others have taught me fundraising, others have taught me in, in science or technology. And so I've had a lot, I've just been very fortunate at the people that have impacted my career and helped uh, shape me, to, you know, into what I'm doing today and the person that I am. Of course, my wife always, she says, I molded you into the, the person you are today. She always says that I, I need, I need to bring that up. Matter of fact, it's on the mentorship. I was very fortunate. I was asked by Syracuse University to do the commencement speech for the uh, College of Engineering graduate students, so the, the masters and PhDs. And I remember I was telling them how important it is to have mentors throughout your, your career. And um, we, you know, I talked a little bit about that and uh, I, I still believe it is very, uh, important to have those that come alongside you and can help provide guidance. Yes, yes, that is so true. So what advice would you give the younger version of yourself? Um, maybe uh, to be more patient. So even though I say I really persevere, I, I usually have a, I need to get this done now uh, sort of mentality. And sometimes it is just timing's not right. Um, you know, maybe the technology hasn't progressed there. Maybe you can't get the cost of goods low enough. Maybe the science isn't there. But I think it's just uh, a younger version, I'd say, learn to be a little bit more patient. And, um, you know, it's, it still all works out. Uh, and, and I find most of the things that I worried about were nonsensical. They, they just never came to pass. Mm. Yeah, patience, um, perseverance. Perseverance is a, a theme we hear a lot on this podcast from successful people. It's, it's very common. Uh, we also find that successful people tend to have idiosyncrasies that are actually their superpowers. What idiosyncrasy do you have? Um, so I think I'm Batman. Um, so that's probably the uh, idiosyncrasy I have. Matter of fact, people met my, my office is decorated with all Batman stuff. But, um, you know, um, I am probably uh, maybe, maybe constantly on. It's probably a little bit difficult to uh, shut me down. And um, I, I would say that's probably it. I also used to, one of our general counsels uh, said, Albert, you're wonderful. You just listen to everybody and you get all their inputs and then you go do exactly what you want to do. You know, <laughs> and, and so he said, it's like, you're really open, but you know, you already sort of have that vision set in your head and you want to execute on that vision. Uh, you know, so I guess those are some of the little quirks uh, that I have. I, I would say uh, definitely I'm OCD. And then I, I, I my, my, uh, I, there's a T-shirt that says I'm CDO. That's OCD put in the right order. And so that's me. I'm very organized. Uh, so people would come into my office and it's like, what do you do? Your office is too clean. Are you even doing anything? It's just because I am so fanatical with being organized, knowing where things are at, being able to retrieve it early. That's probably the military upbringing in me. 
Um, but uh, I, I'll say those are the things, my idiosyncrasies. That makes sense. And I thought I saw Batman on your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big uh, Batman, the animated series. I'm a big Batman uh, uh, fan. Well, that's awesome. Albert, I'm curious, what do you struggle with the most? What is your weakness or your kryptonite? Um, <clears throat> wow. So I probably struggle, you know, back to what I'll say. I told the younger version of me to be patient. Uh, I like things to happen, right? It's like I always want to have that forward momentum. And if I feel like I'm stagnant or stalled, boy, that uh, that just sort of drives me crazy. So my, my kryptonite is probably not enough patience. Um, uh, I'll, I'll say that that's certainly uh, a weakness um, that I, I constantly try to work on. Um, and then I think... Uh, I, I struggle in general, though, I think we found a very friendly uh, investor. I do struggle a lot with uh, the funding community, and it's unfair to generalize, but the, I see so many good innovations. And so I think another weakness is it's like all these innovations I'm exposed to because I'm, I'm, again, very fortunate. I, I have the opportunity to serve on over 20 different academic technology boards. And so I, I get first look at a lot of uh, very interesting, uh, uh, you know, approaches in uh, the technology and science. And part of my frustration is, and again, weakness, I want all these things to get out there and I wish they could all get funded and, and really to the benefit of uh, humankind. And uh, I, I I don't see it. it probably has to go back to patience again, you know, um, but because I just want them to happen now. So I'm a little bit frustrated how we decide what gets funded, what doesn't get funded, what where do we get grants, where do we not get grants. So I, I, I struggle a little bit with that. So that's weakness. By the way, in the Batman comic books, Batman beat Superman, I want you to know, uh, when the two of them fought. So uh, so I, I so I don't have kryptonite's a Superman thing, not a Batman thing. I'm just I'm just messing with you, Stacey. I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know that Batman and, and Superman fought. So they they weren't on the same team. Uh, they typically were on the same team, but they did uh, fight in uh, in the old graphic novels. And Batman beat Superman. So. Oh wow! <laughs> well, um, that's good to know. Uh, my dad <laughs> used to be a, a comic book collector when he was a, a kid. So. Okay. Um, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to, to tell him about that. Uh, he may already know. Yeah. Um, so Albert, I'm curious, what message or principle do you wish you could teach everyone? Oh my goodness. <clears throat> um, I think the message, because this is one of the things I do try to live by is to be a servant to others. And, you know, I don't mean servant in the, you know, like the butler type of servant or whatever, but, but place others first. And um, I do, you know, you got to be trustworthy. You got to be vulnerable, right? You, you got to, you know, you can only take people at face value. You, I mean, it doesn't mean don't definitely leverage wisdom, but I think, uh, you know, you need to be open. Uh, you need to trust others. You need to be a servant to others. And most importantly, and this may sound a little corny, but, you know, I, I uh, believe that you just got to love your, you know, fellow human and, uh, and uh, try to make things better. Yes, yes, uh, that, that, is, I, that I, I agree with that, that servant leadership and, uh, and do unto others. Albert, I'm curious about books. Um, some of our, our guests say that they've had a key book that they've read that really helped them in their approach to success or changed their mindset about success. Is there a key book in your life that has impacted you the most? I'd love to hear about that. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, I will tell you most, a lot of the things I read are more like technical journals and so forth. So I, I don't, and I don't mean this offensively, but I don't put a lot of stock in 
the latest book on this is how you should operate a business or um, and so forth. But, you know, the one book that, that I read every day is the Bible, and I'll just I'll leave it at that. So uh, that's that's my uh, my model. Hey, I love that. I love that. Um, lots of good proverbs yeah. in the Bible, right? Yeah, absolutely. Lots of good good it, tips on how to live. Yeah, absolutely. How you interact with others, how to live. Um, and so I, you know, I'm so far from that perfect standard, but it's something that I try to uh, ingrain every day through reading uh, that. And don't get me wrong. I mean, there's other books that I've read on new ways to run a business or new, you know, models uh, of how you should do a particular tool or a particular approach. And I've certainly done things that, you know, talk about new development methodologies and so forth. But I just, I find that hybrids typically are better. I haven't found the one cookie cutter that's perfect for all the situations. I have a tendency to blend multiple things uh, to bring the outcome that is best for the culture and for the company and for our customers and shareholders and so forth. So I think it's a hybrid uh, model. So no game changing books other than the Bible is the only one. I love that. I love that. Um, well, Albert, you've got the mic. What is one last thing that you want to share with our listeners of the People of Animal Health podcast before you drop the mic today? Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, thank you so much for the opportunity. I think, um, you know, we've covered most things. I would uh, certainly say, um, you know, before dropping the mic, uh, uh, you know, again, back to perseverance. If you have a dream, if you have that vision, pursue it. Uh, you know, a perfect example is people thought I was nuts when in my late 50s, I'm looking to start another business. And now I'm in my early 60s. And it's like, why are you spending your retirement money to do this? And it's just something I believed in, something I felt passionate about. And so I would say, if you have those, again, you got to wisely pursue it. I'm not saying take silly, uncalculated risks, but, uh, you know, be, be, pursue that passion and come alongside others that can help you uh, to realize it or to pivot if you need to pivot. And so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, Albert, I want to thank you so much for joining us today on the People of Animal Health podcast. Thank you very much. I appreciate being a guest. It was great having you here. Thanks again, Albert. Okay, take care.